Isaiah 43, 1 through 3. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Yes. I have called you by name. Yes. You are mine. Yes. When you pass through the waters, I will be there with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. Mm. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. Yes. Amen. And the flame shall not consume you. Yes. For I am the Lord your God, yes. the Holy One of Israel, yes. your Savior. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Yes, Amen. God. We thank you, God, that you know each of us by name, God. You know the very hairs on our head, God. And we thank you, God, that you call us a friend. And God, we thank you. Yes, God.
your victory, cause your power is within me. No giant can defeat me, cause you hold my head. You know my name. Yes, you do, God. Cause you know my name. In every language, God, you know my name. You know my name. Whatever you believe in God for, walk in it. Yes, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love that song. That song says, he knows your name. He knows my name. How awesome is it for the creator of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth to know your name. When you feel invisible, when you feel invisible sometimes, even in a crowd, Please know that you're not alone. Why? Because he sees you. He knows you. He's called you. He knows you by name. So today, City Mission, today, family, friends, I want you to walk in victory, not because of what you did, but because the power of God, if you know him, the power of God lives in you. The song says, no battle can turn me. Why? because he holds our hand.
We serve an awesome God today. And I'm excited to, to just be before you, Sunitra and I. Um, just want to say good morning, City Mission. Good morning, family, friends. Good morning, all who may watch us on social media. Um, we love you today. We welcome you to our virtual Sunday worship service this morning. I'm Pastor Jackie, and along with me, beside me, around me, praying for me, is my is my uh, is my wife, my friend, my confidant, uh, Sunitra, who's behind the camera. Um, it's so good to be before you this morning. And I'm so glad you joined us this morning. I believe God has a word for you this morning. So I want you to hang on. Uh, remember, since we are virtual only, let us know that you're with us. Give us a shout out. Let us know where you're streaming from. Let us know who you are. Um, let us know that you're with us. Put it in the chat. Also, um, this is a conversation that... Uh, we need to have. This is a conversation that, that your friends and your family needs to hear. So I want you to do me a favor. If you're watching right now, share this message on your page. Just hit the share button because this is a way of getting an important message out to, uh, to your family and to your friends and to, to whomever may watch it. Um, I also want you to pull your teenager in. Pull If you've got young adults living in the house, I want you to pull them in so that they can hear this message. If you've got uh, uh, preteens, I want you to pull them in so that they can hear this message today. Amen. Because I think it's relevant, it's godly, and it's a necessary conversation that needs to happen today. Amen. I also want to let you know Number one, thank you for your prayers. Um, your prayers helped us uh, determine when we're going to come back together in in-person services. So your prayers and our prayers and using the wisdom of God, we've determined that the first Sunday in March, 7 March, is when we're returning to in-person services. So we are excited for a comeback. Continue to pray in faith and set your expectations high. Um, as we come back together and prepare for the season we have, uh, for the season ahead of us, for the season right now and for the season ahead of us. I hope you're ready. I am. I'm ready to see you. I've missed you. And uh, it's going to be a powerful uh, time when we come back together. Also, today is first Sunday. We have communion today and we're going to take communion together um, after the message. So grab your bread, grab your crackers, grab your juice as we celebrate Jesus together. Amen. If you're sitting in your living room, I want you to stretch your hands towards your, your laptops as, as, uh, as a symbol of stretching your hand towards me as I attempt to bring God's word today. Um, can I tell you, we had this morning, we had a powerful time in prayer. And my prayer is that God do not move me. Do not move us out of that position that you had us in this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for another opportunity to share together in worship and word. It's life. It's Zoe life, oh God. We thank you that you do know our name, that the very hairs on our head, they're numbered, oh God. Father, you did not, this, whatever is going on in our world and in our life did not catch you by surprise. You know all things, God. So God, we pray today that you would speak to us. Speak to us your wonderful and amazing truth today. We need you, Holy Spirit, on today as we bring forth your word I need you, God, to bring forth your word in clarity. And we need you, God, to hear, oh Lord, behind what Jackie may say. We want to hear the voice of God today. Now I pray that you may give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That you may open the eyes of our understanding that they might be enlightened. That we may know the hope of the calling and the riches of your glorious inheritance and the exceeding greatness of your power 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Today, we're going to continue to talk about why the church ain't working. Boy, did we have some great discussions in our discipleship groups uh, last week. And if you were not a part of those discipleship group discussions, you missed out. But don't worry. Don't fret. We'll continue these discussions uh, this particular week. And I challenge you to be a part because we need to hear your voice. We need to hear uh, your thoughts and we need to hear your questions because this is how we grow. We don't grow. We can't grow off one meal per week. We have to get together and sharpen each other. The Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. We have to sharpen each other. So we talked about why the church ain't working. And now, and we know that that's an oxymoron because number one, Jesus told us already, he says in Matthew chapter 16 and 18, he says, I tell you, Peter, this is what he said on this rock, on my word, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The gates of hell will not succeed in derailing and defeating the church. We win in the end. But we have to look at the statistics today. And the statistics show that there's a departure of our teens. There's a departure of our young adults. There's a, a departure of, of, of Christians that's been following Jesus for quite some time. There is a, part, a departure. They're no longer interested in the church. They're no longer interested in the things of God. Guess what? Many, and many may be in your home. Many may be your children. Many may be your co-workers. Many have grown apathetic. They've grown cold, indifferent, and altogether disinterested in church and the things of God. So this is a subject that we must talk about, that we must investigate. And guess what? Be willing to receive criticism in order to effectively tackle this particular pandemic. Very much like a disease, the church must be committed to tackling the root cause of this particular exodus, not chasing after the symptoms. We've done that far too long. We've created programs and process and all of those things trying to get after it, but we need to dig down and stop treating the symptoms. And we need to diagnose the root of the problem. We need to define reality. And until we define reality, we can't cut the root. We can't get after the root of the problem. Lord, my prayer is that let this looming pandemic of children, teens, adults, let this looming pandemic be a burden to all Christians. And let this pandemic be a burden to city mission here in Kaiserslautern. Let it be a burden to our ministry to the military and our freedom outreach team. That we may get after this problem and see a shift back to Jesus. I, wanna, I shared this story last week and I'm going to share it really quickly uh, this week. The, the, classic, the classic children's story of the Pied Piper, the Pied Piper of Hamlin, and the setting is in the city of Hamlin, Hamlin, Germany, about five hours north of K-Town. They were suffering an epidemic, but instead of it being uh, Corona, the coronavirus, the town was suffering from an infestation of rats. And then a stranger, a Piper, strolls into town and promises a solution to get rid of the mice, to get rid of the rats for some of money. He says, I have the solution. And then the townsmen agreed. They said, we will give you a large sum of money if you can get rid of these rats. So the pipe piper came in the town and he began to play his pipe, a high pitched sound that lured the rats to follow him and he led the rats into a nearby river where all of the rats drowned. He solved the problem. But the dilemma was 
the townsmen did not want to pay him. They did not want to give him the money that he so rightfully earned. So the Pied Piper stormed away, but he didn't stay away. He came back with a plan in mind. The Pied Piper came back, came back angry, plotting, how can I get them back? So the story goes days later, after all of the townsmen and the residents, as they were, guess what? Sitting in church, attending church, singing and worshiping, the piper returns and begin to play his musical instrument again. This time, this time, the tune was sweet. It was low. It was dreamy. And rather than the rats following after him, the kids, the children, the teenagers, they begin to follow after him. All 130 children in that village. The lure of the pipe was so irresistible that the piper led the children to a nearby mountain cave where they were locked in the cave, never ever to be seen again. Now this is a story, this is a fairy tale, but I find it ironic and intriguing that the children were easily enticed and lured away while the adults sat in church unaware of what's going on. This is a sad story, but the story captures the unawareness, I would even say the obliviousness of many of our Christian churches today. Many of our people today, we have a great time in church, but we are wholly unaware, wholly uninvested in the spiritual growth and the maturity of our teens and our young adults and even our Christians that seem to have been that that have been in church a long time there is a need for discipleship i still believe the church is the hope of the world i still believe we are the church the called the sent ones i still believe the church is the hope of the world. Who is the church? You are the church. You are the church. If you believe that you are the church, I want you to just shout, I am the church. And I will be a part of the solution of shifting this pandemic. So church, let's wake up and let's get after this exodus. We first have to define reality. What is it? We said it last week. Research says one in four Americans, and this mirrors the Western church as well, one in four Americans attend church. The number of Americans not attending church has doubled since 2000. It also states, it also reveals that approximately 42% of America is made up of generation Z, and millennials. Millennials are uh, 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 people who were born between 1981 and 1996. If that fits you, you are a millennial. And Gen Z, those are, 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 are people that have been born between 1997 and the year 2012. If that's you, you're considered a Gen Zer. So millennials make up most of the population, about 72 million, and then Gen Zers about 67 million. That makes a total of 139 million people out of 332 million in America. But only half, 49% of millennials and Gen Zers identify as being Christian. Where did they go? Some of them left the faith altogether. Some of them have uh, uh, kind of fallen away from consistent church attendance. Some have become non-practicing Christians. Some have become atheists, agnostic, and some have even become other religions. They are running away from the church. Why? We have to ask the question, why? Is this generation that's coming behind us losing interest in the church? 
And we, we, we looked at Joshua last week. Joshua, in the book of Joshua, he challenged Israel. He said, listen, I want you to be, you need to be loyal to God. And the, and the children of Israel, they agreed. They said, you have our pledge that we will follow after you and we would never forget. We would never forget the Lord. We would never forget his promises. We would never forget the things that he did for us. There's one thing to have a goal. There's another thing to execute. There's one thing that uh, you heard the saying, a goal without a plan is just a wish. A goal without a plan is just a wish. And by failing to prepare, we fail altogether. I'll say it again. By, by failing to prepare, you prepare to fail. By failing to prepare and seek God in our preparation, if we fail to do that, we prepare, we set ourselves up for failure. In just two chapters after they confessed and made a pledge to serve God, just two chapters after that in the book of Judges, a new generation arose and they did not know God. It's found in Judges chapter 2 verses 10. It says, after Joshua's generation had been gathered to their ancestors, Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for their fathers, what, they, what he had done, what God had done for Israel. The Israelites, they did whatever was right in their own eyes. They did evil. Doesn't that sound familiar? Today, there is no standard of truth. A large majority of society believes that there is no standard for truth. But we believe that the truth lies in God's word. That that is the truth. That is the standard of truth. And I quoted uh, D.L. Moody last week. And I, it's worth being redundant. It's worth being redundant. D.L. Moody said, as he approached his final days in life, he says some key words. He says, if I could relive my life all over again, I would devote my entire ministry to reaching children. I read that quote and it done something to me. I mean, it pricked my heart. He says, there is no more of a nobler challenge or, or, or greater responsibility than for us to raise a child for God. I think we're failing in one of the highest callings upon us. Why does it appear that we're losing a generation? Why does it appear that way? Many of us, many Christians, have not taken an honest look at themselves. We've not taken an honest look at ourselves, and we've not taken an honest look at the church, but instead, we simply pointed the finger in judgment at our millennials, at our Gen Zers, and said things like this. It's an entitled generation. They are uncommitted. They are uninterested. And I'm pointing my finger to get the point across. They're uninterested in the things of God. And we've said a variety of other things. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this right here. Please hear this. He said this in the cost, his book, The Cost of Discipleship. He said, judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. I'll say it again. Judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. He went on to say, by judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace which others are just as entitled to as we are. Such a powerful, powerful statement by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Could it be a lack of authentic servant leadership in the church? Could it be a lack of passion for the, for the youth, for our teens, for our young adults? Could it be a lack of knowledge on how to reach them? Could it be? Could it be 
that us, we as parents, we have neglected our responsibility to do exactly what Deuteronomy chapter 6 tells us. It's God's instructions. Deuteronomy 6 and 6 says, these commandments I give to you today, you are to do what? They should be on your hearts and you are to impress them upon your children. You are to talk to them when you sit home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Could it be that we've introduced our children to church but failed to introduce them to Jesus? It's about a relationship. I reached out to some of some some friends and I reached out to family um, so that they can answer this question. Why ain't the church working? Why is it the church working? And I received the answers I received. They were raw and they were real. Let's listen to some of them. Last week we hit two and we'll finish up this week. But one of the responses was, I feel my attention towards church has been declining because the knowledge I've gained by reading and studying the Bible for myself and the in-depth uh, uh, study from college, the, the in-depth Bible study, it's given me a, a good foundation. And he said, when I attend church, church is shallow. And what they preach about is wishy-washy and much of the stuff I've already learned. I said, how do you answer that? How do you answer that question? Some of us said, man, we must go deeper. And I agree, we must go deeper. But we can't go so deep that we miss the unbeliever and we miss the new believer. But we can't be too shallow as not to stir and stimulate the mature believer. This is the reason for our sermon-based discipleship groups. So that we can dig deeper and answer the questions that one might have. Our messages must produce a hunger and thirst for God. It must produce stronger faith because we understand that faith comes by what? How do we get faith? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. We got to train and equip, equip Christians, young and old in the faith, for ministry today and for ministry tomorrow. I will submit to you this. I will submit to you this, that uh, that the truth, the pillar and support of truth, we can't deviate from. The word of God, we can't deviate from. That's what uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and 15 says. But the church is much more. The church, would you agree with me? The church is a witness to the city. It's a witness to our community. The church is an ambassador. It is a voice crying out. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. Jesus. The church is a witness. The church is a hospital. The church is for the wounded. The church is for the broken. It's where people can go and receive their healing in Jesus' name. It's a place for redemption and a place for freedom. Oh, do we need redemption or do we need freedom in our lives listen to what uh john chapter 8 verses 36 said jesus says if the son has set you free you are free indeed that means if the son has set you free you are free through and through there's freedom found in jesus there's freedom found in the church so the church stands for truth. The church is a hospital. The church is, is, is an ambassador. The church is, is freedom and redemption. And the church is a family. It is a community. In Acts chapter 2, it said they did four things well. They heard the word of God from the men of God daily. They fellowship together. They broke bread together and they prayed together. They did life together. And as a result, the experience, they experienced miraculous miracles and wonders in the church. Everyone's needs were met in this environment. 
The Lord added to the church daily. The Lord did. Another question. The church has really turned me off in 2020, especially because it was it has been so politically charged. And this was hurtful for me to hear. It said the church is hypocritical. We're hypocrites. And I had to listen to that. And I could somewhat agree. Life research studies stated that hypocrisy. I want to hear your comments on this. Hypocrisy was the second reason why this, why the following generation, the, the millennials and Gen Z, it says it's the second highest reason that they walk away. They become disinterested in the church. Man, that should that should do something to you. And Jesus dealt with hypocrisy severely. In Matthew chapter 15 and 7, Jesus called them out. He called the Pharisees out. He said, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you for he wrote these people. Listen to this. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They honor me through their talk, but behind closed doors, they have a heart of evil. The heart does not honor me. He says, they worship in vain. Their worship is hollow. Their worship is futile. For they teach man-made ideas as though they are commands from God. Wow. That's something that we need to just settle on. No Christian is perfect. None, no one is perfect but Jesus. But we must rely on the Holy Spirit to live congruent lives. We must rely on the Holy Spirit to guide our actions and align them with our words. We must guard against the drift of becoming incongruent. Craig Rochelle, he said this, he said, people would rather follow her Follow a leader that is real than a leader that's always right, that always has to be right, that their way is the only way. We know that God's truth does not fail. It's the only way, but your opinion, our opinions, when it comes down to it, it really doesn't matter. We have to stand on the truth of God's word and our actions and what we do, our display, whether it be in public, whether it be on social media, whether it be uh, it, whatever it is, our actions must align with God's word, the heart, the love of Christ, the grace of Christ, the truth of Christ. When we speak it, we got to walk it and live it out. Amen. People, another question, another statement. People don't go to church because they don't trust the church. The pastors and the leaders, they don't trust us. They say we lack, the church lack, the pastors, they lack integrity. This not only applies to unbelievers, but guess what? Committed Christians oftentimes have left the church because they view the leaders untrustworthy. They view the leaders narcissistic, abusive, low in accountability with many moral failures. And guess what? Unfortunately, their lack of trust is oftentimes warranted. Many Christians and Christian leaders, we live in congruent lives. We preach love on a Sunday, but spew hate on a weekday. Oftentimes, we do not demonstrate the love and the grace of Christ in our words or in our actions. How do we respond to this? How do you respond to it? What do you say? Don't be quick to say, it's just what they say. How do you respond? Does it break your heart? How can we respond as a church? Some, feels that, some feel that all pastors want is their membership and their money. They feel like the church is really not interested 
in their interest. So why go? Why go to church? They feel that the church is nothing but a big scam. So why should I attend something? If I'm going to be scammed, let me be scammed in the streets. Let me be duped in the streets. I'd rather be duped in the streets than be duped in the church. How do we respond to that? It's hard. It's, a, it's hard to hear on a Sunday. It's hard for me to hear. But listen to Proverbs 10 and 9. Proverbs 10 and 9 says, He who walks in integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will be found out. We've read Matthew chapter 15 and 7 where Jesus just called him out. He said, you hypocrites, you honor me with your lips, but your heart, it's so far away from me. How do we respond to this? I want your comments. I want to see your comments. And I'm going to reply to your comments. And I know it's probably, I can't see your comments, but I know you're putting some in there. And guess what? I am going to answer each and every one of them. And better yet, I want to challenge you to jump in the discipleship groups where we can really talk it out loud, where you'll be around other believers in that discipleship group, old, I mean, mature believers and young believers. And we can talk out loud so everyone can be edified in that. That's the goal, that we get to the truth, we get to solutions, and that we be edified, that we be discipled. Amen. How do we best approach it? The best way to overcome this challenge, one of them, is to seek to earn trust. Be a high accountability church. Be a high accountability person. Be a church of truth, truth, and transparency. Amen. Here's a quote for you. For us, here's a quote that, 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 that they say. For us to follow you long term, long term, our, our number one requirement is that you be trustworthy. Our number, in order for people to follow us, leaders, Christians, our number one requirement is that you be trustworthy. And I know what you're saying. Like, who's to say that you are trustworthy? It's not about them. It's about you. It's about us. How do we align with the heart of God? Proverbs 27 and 19, it says, listen to this. Write this one down. It says, as the water reflect the face, so one's life reflects the heart. As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. It reflects the real person. It reflects the real person. You are not going to, you're not going to like me for saying this. Watch a person's life. Watch a person's speech. Watch a person's social media post. Watch their movements. And guess what? You'll know their heart. You'll know their heart. That's a hard saying, but it's so true. People are not who, listen to this. People are not who uh, you should be. Other people are not who sh you should be most concerned about, though. Rather, it, your, your, your concern or my concern, our concern, it sh should be about how God looks at us. It should be about how God looks at us. God shape me, mold me, and make me to be the image of Jesus Christ, to love hard like Jesus, to speak the truth like Jesus with grace and in love. I like to say, man, in order for truth to fly, it needs to run on the on, it needs to run on the runway of grace. In order for truth to take off, it has to run on the runway of grace. Another, another reason. It says, uh, the reason there's less interest in attending church is because we feel like the church judges and condemns us 
before they get to know us. Jamil, do we have any uh, comments? Should I should I address any right now? Um, there's a question. Okay. Kenny B said, "Do you think people hold on, hold an unrealistic ex expectation on the church? Do people insist on the same level of accountability and consistency in other areas?" I, I do. I, I sometimes it's unrealistic because, uh, Kenny. Sometimes I believe there are unrealistic expectations across the board, right? But if they're not in the church, then there's an expectation of the church. So I, I do think it's unrealistic uh, expectations, but we know that perception is oftentimes reality, right? So we, 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 we talk about love and we talk about grace, but yet oftentimes, not all, not in all cases, when they see us arguing, when they see us having immoral failures, then then they point the fingers unbelievers and people outside of the church then they point the fingers so i think and we're going to get that we're going to talk about that i do think that we have to walk and align ourselves closely with the word of god and it's not about what they do or what they think guess what it's about what we do what you do what we do as christians we've got to give them a model Amen. I have a comment from Wesley Sims. Uh huh. I've been in church. What's up, for, Scotty? I've been in church for over 35 years and have never met a pastor or been in a church that I did not trust the minister. Hmm. Maybe I've been to great churches, or is it I see them through the love of God? Amen. So, so that needs to be talked about. That needs to be talked about. I, so, so Scotty, I have been a part of a church where I know the pastor may have started out well, but got lifted up in pride and would say, would curse behind the pulpit and say just horrible things behind the scenes. And, and you know that when you're in that leadership group, you know that when you're part, when you're a part, uh, when you're close, closely aligned with the leader, so there are pastors and leaders out there um, where their heart is not aligned with the heart of Christ. Um, fortunately, you've been a part of incredible ministries, it sounds like. Um, but I know there are some out there that, that their hearts are not aligned with the heart of Christ. And, and Christians, mature Christians, we have to look even at those pastors through the eyes of Christ and say that, man, if they were once in line with Christ, then they've not gone too far for Christ to bring them back in, for Christ to love on them again. And, and mature believers, we still pray. We still fast. We still believe in God for every person. Amen. That's a conversation we should have in our discipleship groups. I'm going to go on. And then uh, we'll, we'll pause and we'll answer a few more questions here in a minute. Um, they say that the church condemns us before they get to know us. Have you ever been judged before? Have you ever felt like you've been condemned before? Before you even made, uh, made it good, before you even uh, stepped in the door good, the greeters had already sized you up. Have you ever felt like that before? We don't wear dresses like that in here. Have you ever felt like that? We don't wear we don't wear pants like that. We don't wear we we don't wear wow, look at that blouse that she's got on. Those tats that he has all on his neck. You know, those earrings that he has, that she has in her nose. Um is that alcohol? Is that cigarettes I smell on him? You see the whispering? We and we can say church doesn't do that. But maybe you've not been a part of a church that did. But it's out there. And it's their perception of the church. Jesus' model was so countercultural in his day. And I believe it should be the same for the church today. Jesus, his motives were different. His motive influenced his actions. His motive influenced his actions. He chose to be around the outcast 
and the sinners and the tax collectors. Look at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 verses 9. I'm not going to read it all, but it highlights when Jesus, when, when the religious found out that Jesus was kicking it with tax collectors and sinners. Man, they had something to say about that. They begin to criticize Jesus. But listen to Jesus' response. This is in Matthew chapter 9. Um, Jesus' response was, It is not healthy. It, it, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Jesus went on to say, But go and learn. He said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come to gather, to call, to minister to, to lay hands on, to heal the sick, the sinners, the outcasts. Jesus said, I come for the sinners. I come for the tax collectors. I come for the liars and the cheaters. I come for the prostitutes. I come from the addicts. Guess what? I come for the LGBTQ. I come for them too. I come from the come for the hurting. And I come for the broken. So if the church could be more caring, if the church could be more forgiving. If the church would not be so judgmental, more people would have a desire to know Jesus. Those that are curious about him might be drawn to the church. How do we respond? How do we respond to that? Can I agree? The church has been a great source of hurt towards sinners. They've been a great source of hurt towards addicts. They've been a great source of hurt towards certain styles of dress, towards sexuality. Let me be clear about this. I want you to get this. Let me be clear. The Bible is not pro same-sex relationships. Neither am I. The Bible is not pro gender fluidity. The Bible is not pro sin, but the Bible is certainly pro people, the creation of God. He's pro people. He loves people. He's got grace for people. He's got grace for us. Jesus did not die only for the saint, but he died for the sinner. Listen to Romans chapter 5 verses 8. It says, but God showed his love for us, all of us, in that while we were yet sinners. It's not a matter. It, he didn't say it, it, it wasn't a matter of what kind of sin. Whether it was stealing, cheating, it, it didn't matter what kind of sin. He says, while we were yet sinners, all sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. Over and over and over again, we see D Jesus demonstrating this kind of mercy for those of us who do not deserve it. But he did it. Jesus welcomed the woman, the lepers. He welcomed the lepers. He touched them and he healed them. When the woman caught in the act of adultery was thrown at Jesus' feet, they waited to, to throw stones, but Jesus threw mercy. Jesus had donor kebabs with the tax collectors, with the chief tax collector, Zacchaeus. The Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus met her. He confronted her. He loved her. He healed her. He transformed her. And then she transformed a community. She transformed a community, a city, by her real connection. Real connection with Jesus. God, we need a real connection with you. We need a real relationship with you. Help us to see through the eyes of Jesus. We can love past what we see. Jesus condemned the righteous and the religious, 
but he befriended the sinners. Jesus made it clear, I come to seek and save those who are lost. He was willing to associate with those by the standards of self-righteous were not good enough. Jesus said, they're good enough in my eyes. Church, we have to reach out. We have to love before we condemn. We have to love on people. We have to show grace towards people, mercy towards people, because that's what Jesus embodied. Grace and truth, not 50-50, 100% grace and 100% truth is what Jesus walked in. So how do we approach this question about judgmental? Number one, about judging people. Number one, have a conversation with them. We are good at, at drive-by scriptures, but we don't create an opportunity for dialogue. We don't create an opportunity to have breakfast, have lunch. We must create opportunity to reason like Paul did with those who don't think like us, with those who don't believe like us, with those who don't look like us, with those who have different political alignments than us, with those who just don't look or believe like us. Otherwise, we'll continue to lose a generation that's already walking out the joy. We have to be committed. Number three, don't compromise biblical standards. At the same time, don't compromise on God's unrelenting love, caring kindness, and forgiving forgiveness for those who are far away from him, even the most wicked sinners. Another, another statement that was made, young adults admit that they don't attend church because their priorities are misaligned. Their priorities are skewed. One person said, there is, a, there is great competition for their time. There's great competition for their attention. And it seems as if uh, these activities become more and more each year. They admit that they place secular education and extracurricular activities above spiritual things. And one said, this is how I was raised. Do we place secular education over religious training and edification? Matthew 6 and 33, we know it. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Another one said, I don't attend church because church leaders don't feel the need to entertain my questions. And they are unable to adequately answer those questions sometimes. I oftentimes have to hide my true beliefs. This is what they're saying. I oftentimes have to hide my true beliefs and feelings because the pastors and the leaders are not interested. As a matter of fact, they get offended if I have questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? Can we answer that? If God is so loving, how can he allow, you fill in the blank, how can he allow my mom to get COVID and die? How can God allow, a loving God, how can he allow my mom to commit suicide? My son to commit, my daughter to commit suicide. How can God allow this natural disaster to take my home? to take my business, to take all that I have, you name it, how, how, how? The gospel by nature demands sacrifice. It demands engagement and risk. And we must sacrifice our time to engage even at the risk of not having the appropriate answers. Can I tell you, I don't always have the appropriate answers but I am willing to engage. We have to be willing to engage. But then if we don't have the answers, we have to take time to pray, study, and re-engage that conversation. Amen. I'll, I'll say one more, and then we'll pause for a couple of questions. 
Some people refuse to attend because they believe God is missing from the church. Some people refuse to attend because they believe God is missing from the church. People go to church because they're hurting. People go to church because they they need a healing. People go to church because they're broken and they're confused. But they say they're having difficulty finding Jesus there. People from Baptist, liturgical, charismatic, Pentecostal, they've left the church in search. They have difficulty and some have left the church in search of Jesus. Perception is reality. We can't ignore, we can't ignore this criticism. Not sure how to respond to this one, but I think it's twofold. Number one, there's a scarcity of personal experience with God, personal relationship with God, and a lack of Christian maturity for some that have left the church. I've noticed uh, some, not all, not all the people who claim to be the most spiritually mature, but there, there, uh, there, there's some that's leaving because they're saying they're not being fed in the church. And can I tell you, many of the ones, not all, many of the ones that said, man, I'm not being fed at this church, they're somewhat judgmental themselves. Generally, they're disinterested in reaching the unchurched friends. Man, I know this is hard this morning, but this is something that we must talk about. Generally, they're disinterested in reaching their unchurched friends. Sometimes, oftentimes, they're self-focused and generally dissatisfied and often unwilling to commit to any church. Really doesn't matter what church it is. That's number one. Number two, I think they're right. If I can be honest, I believe there is also a lack of demonstration of the power of God in many churches. Yes, singing is great. Yes, preaching is great. But if there is a lack of the Holy Spirit's presence in that church, there will continue to be an exodus of the church. We can sing, we can shout, we can put together programs and processes, but if the Holy Spirit is not present in the church, there will continue to be an exodus of the church. First Timothy tells us, First Timothy 3, First Timothy 3 and 5 says, it is possible to have a form of godliness, but lack the power thereof. If we're not connected to Jesus, if we're not connected to the vine, guess what? We will not and cannot be fruitful in what we do. So what is the response of the church? We got any, uh, any comments? I'll answer one right now. I want to I wanna try to finish this. Um, I answer one or two comments. Okay, Bonnie Sims comment. She said, it's not about God allowing, it's about each of us appropriating what he has done through his son, Jesus. If you're not in a vital relationship with God yourself, you will blame him, <coughs> excuse me, for bad things. Mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, for bad things. But the devil is the author of evil, sin, sickness, Amen. failure, not God. God is love and he is good. Amen. Amen. And that that's the importance of of talking about a relationship. Um, the, the, the one young man that says, man, I don't have to attend church because I know the Bible for myself. I've studied it. That is great. But you need the community of believers around you. It's not just about having Bible knowledge because Paul tells us what knowledge does what knowledge puffs up. So we have to have a relationship. It's got to be about uh, a relationship. Um, we're 
we're we're dependent, we're interdependent, we're dependent on God, and we're dependent on one another. Amen. That's a great, great comment. So I ask you, what is the response of the church? How do we answer this dilemma? I looked at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 24 and 10, and the Bible says, uh, in the later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and, and uh, teaching of demons. In Matthew 24, it tells us many will fall away. Many will betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, listen to this, the love of many will grow cold. The question for you and I, the question for the church is, do we throw up our hands and do nothing? Or do we make a declaration like Joshua did? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Do we make Joshua's declaration? Or do we hear Mordecai's declaration to Esther as our own declaration? Where it says, for if I remain silent at this time, if I remain silent at this time, who knows? but that God has placed you here, me here, for such a time as this to make a difference. To make a difference in my home, to make a difference on my job, to make a difference in my community. God has set us here for a time as this. And then Paul, will we throw our hands up or will we declare like Paul declared, though I am free, and belong to no one. Paul said this. He says, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Paul went on to say, to the Jews, I became like a Jew. I could say to a millennial, I became, I related to a millennial. To, to, to the Gen Zers, I related to them. To, to this person or to that person, I related to them. Paul says to the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. Said to the weak, I became weak, to, the, to win the weak. He says, I have become all things to all people so that by all means possible, I might participate in saving some. Is that your declaration today? Is that your declaration? Is your declaration not on my watch Will my kids not understand the Lord? Not on my watch will my kids not have a relationship. Not on my watch will, will, will people walk around and walk towards hell while I sit back and enjoy my salvation. No, we have a responsibility as ambassadors for Christ. We have a responsibility to share the love and the truth of Jesus Christ. We are in a war. If you haven't figured that out already, we are in a war. We are in a battle. We are fighting for our generation and the generations to come after them. We are in the battle today. And if you know anything about war, the enemy seeks to have you. If we know anything about spiritual war, we know that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy you. They come to. He comes to steal, kill. He sends. He sends his his angels, his evil angels, to to kill off a generation. And if he can kill off a generation, then he can hinder, possibly hinder the momentum and the movement forward of the church. I want to read this to you. I want to read. I don't have it on the screen, but I just want to take a moment to read Ephesians chapter six. And it said this, it says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The, Bi the Bible goes on to say, this is Ephesians chapter 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take 
your stand against the devil's scheme. The devil knows that you have purpose and that your seed has purpose. And if he can unroot that seed, if he could kill that seed, he has us where he wants us. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Then it goes on to say, therefore, 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 since you understand that we are in a spiritual war and what takes place in the physical is based on what happens in the spiritual. He says, you are in a battle. You are in a campaign. You are fighting not only for this generation, but we're fighting for the generation to come after us. He says, since you recognize that, this is how I want you to fight. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after and after you have done everything to stand, it says, stand firm then with the belt of truth. The battle, the battle will not be won if we don't stand in the truth of God. If we don't stand on his word, if we don't stand in truth, we'll be driven back. It says stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist it is the foundation of life let me go ahead and read this it says with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace in addition to all of this take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all flaming arrows from the evil one it says, take the helmet of salvation, put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Here's what I want you to get. It says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions. Begin to pray in the spirit. Begin to pray in your prayer language. Begin to ask God, God, sometimes I don't know what to pray. I'm confused, but God Help me to communicate with you. And you just begin to pray in the spirit. It says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. And Paul says, pray for me also that I may preach the word we're talking about paul a hebrew of hebrews we're talking about paul has written majority of the new testament paul says i need your prayers to continue to do the work of god and can i tell you i need your prayers to continue to do the work of god you need my prayer we need each other's prayers to continue to be effective against this pandemic of our young people walking away from the church. We are in the war. But I believe, I still believe, the church is the hope of the world. I'm going to get through this really quick, and then we're going to take communion. How do we do it? What do we do? While we're not perfect, no one's perfect, there's many moral failures, there's many sins that we uh, have committed, but pastors and leaders must seek to live a life worthy of the calling of Christ. You'd be surprised the people that will forgive you if you surrender to Christ and if you repent quickly and if you're bold and say, I was wrong in this area. David is a prime example for us of humility and repentance. Number two, we must stick closely to God's word and seek to disciple. We must seek to make a true investment 
in training and equipping those who would train and equip others. It's an investment that we have to make. Success isn't always about greatness. It's about consistently pouring into others. It's about consistently investing your time, your talent, and your treasure, investing that in the church, investing that in people around you. It's not about a great sermon. It's not about great worship. It's about consistently and unwaveringly pouring into the lives of our youth, our teens, and our young adults. We've got to point them to Jesus. John chapter 12, verses 32 says, if I am lifted up, Jesus says, if I am lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. We have to lift Jesus up. People tried to worship Paul. They tried to worship Peter. They were like, no, no, no. It's all because of him. We've got to lift Jesus up. And lastly, the church's dependency must not be on programs. The church's dependency must not be on a person's intellect or their skills to organize. It must be on the Holy Spirit. Not our intellect, not our agenda. Otherwise, the church becomes impotent. It lacks power. We've got to strip away all the gimmicks because whatever we use to attract people is the same thing we're going to need to use to keep them. Strip away all the gimmicks. We've got to move back to the basics. More of you, Holy Spirit, and less of us. More of you, God. More of your power. More of your anointing. Because we can train and equip, but if we lack the power of the Holy Spirit to undergird all of the things that we attempt to do, we fail miserably. And the church remains. It, it, the church will be futile in the things that they do if we don't lean in and rely on the Holy Spirit. There must be a holy reliance on the Holy Spirit to move. This generation behind us They've seen the fruit of religion. They've seen the fruit of men without, without the power of God. And they are neither impressed or intrigued by it at all. But when they see God in action, when they see the power of the Holy Spirit in action, they'll fall on their knees. And they'll, they'll say like the man said, what must I do? To be saved. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to connect with Jesus? What does it take? We've got to show them Jesus. We've got to talk about Jesus. We've got to point them to him. We've got to model Jesus in front of them. We've got to embody Jesus. That's part that is the church let's pray father in the name of jesus there is a pandemic covid 19 is here but covid 19 is temporary the real pandemic god that we look at and we are witnessing today is our teens and our young adults are exiting the church are running away, running away from the things of God. And God, we know that the church cannot fail. We know that the church is the hope of the world. And God, I pray, O oh Lord, that we would begin to look internally at us, at ourselves. And God, I pray that we would begin to draw nearer unto you, O oh God. Draw nearer unto you. We begin to lean not to our own understanding, but we'll acknowledge you in our plans and in our ways and in our life and in our demonstration, God. I pray, oh God, 
that we would be led by you, Holy Spirit. Give us the ability to witness effectively to our children. Give us the ability, O oh God, to witness effectively to our coworkers. I pray, O oh God, that you would give us the boldness, O oh God, and the caring concern, O oh Lord, to share your gospel with our friends and our family and those that are around us, our neighbors, O oh God. I pray, O oh Lord, that as we do this, there will be a shift in the momentum, God, as the kids, as our youth walk away, God, they would turn back towards you. God, this is what we declare today. This is an expectation, God, as we begin to get on our knees and we begin to seek you, the power of your anointing, God. I pray for City Mission right now that we would be sold out for you, God, and we would be committed to winning a generation for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 For those that may be watching now that don't know Christ, for those that may watch at a later time, you're like, God, I don't have a relationship with you, but I want one. I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want you to repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe Jesus is your son who was sent to this earth to die on a cross and then go to a grave and then to rise again so that I, make it personal, so that I might be saved. Jesus, thank you for coming. Jesus, thank you for dying. Jesus, thank you for paying for my sins. Thank you for rising again so that I may be made free. I ask you now, O oh God, to come into my heart, to forgive me, O oh God, for my sins, to cleanse me. I pray, O oh God, that you would be my Savior and my Lord, now and forever. I receive you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. If you pray that prayer, you are right with Christ. You are a part of God's family. Amen. And don't let anyone tell you anything different. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you have your communion with you now? If you got your communion with, with you, I want you to um, grab your family if, if they've run in the bathroom, if they've run in the room or in the kitchen somewhere. I want you to grab your family and, and you guys sit together as we take communion. Um, here, Jamil. Amen. Um, I tell you, it's an honor. Every first Sunday, we take communion. And I want you to take. I want you to know that when we take communion, this is a sacred time. It's a remembering of what Christ did. It's a time of celebration. Um, and we get to do this with Him. We didn't earn our way to this table. We were invited to the table. We were invited guests by the creator himself. We were invited by Jesus, every Christian. So God, we come humbly before the table, thanking you for what you did on the cross. The Lord's Supper is commanded by Jesus for us to remember, remember the person and the work of him. Number two, it's a personal thing. Remember where you were when you first met Christ. Remember where you were when Christ begins, began to, to tug on your heart. And you finally said, God, I surrender. I give you my life and be my Lord. Remember where you were. 
and it's about a proclamation. It says, God, when I do this, when I take communion, the Lord's Supper, I do this as a proclamation until he comes again. It's a declaration that you believe in him. It's a declaration of your faith. I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and then we'll pray a short prayer and then we'll take communion together. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 28. It says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink, up, drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, they eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and a number of you have fallen asleep. Let's just take time to examine ourselves. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pause for a moment before we sup with you and sup with one another. We pause. God, we look over our life. We look over the last 24 hours, 48 hours. We look over this week, God. God, we ask that you would cleanse us, purify us, make us white as snow. Cleanse us from all of our sins. Your word says you're faithful and just to, to do that. To cleanse us from all of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we stand humbly and thankfully in your presence. Amen. Go ahead and take the bread in your hand. If you have your bread or your cracker. And I'll read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 24. And it reads, For I have received of the Lord that also which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, as we break the bread, we remember your body. We remember the bloodshed. We remember what you did on the cross. God, you didn't do it out of obligation. You did it out of love. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, please take the bread. Go ahead and take your, your cup. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 25 through 26, it says, After the same manner, he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he returns. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you. We thank you for the bloodshed. We thank you, God, for willingly denying yourself you said not my will but your will be done god we thank you that as a result of your sacrifice we get to commune and sup with you and sup with one another and we'll continue to do this until you return we thank you and we love you in jesus name amen please take the cup Amen. Can you just give God a hand praise? Amen. It is so amazing that while we're on Zoom, yet we're still a family. We're still connected. We're still taking the Lord's Supper together and with him. Before we, uh, before we depart, I want to encourage you to join our discipleship groups as we discuss what we talked about today. Our discipleship groups we specifically designed these so that we can have discussions about tough subjects so we can sharpen one another. Amen. And this is what's necessary. Also, remember 
Mark your calendar. First Sunday in March, we're coming back. We're reconnecting with in-person services. So the registration is already open. Um, go ahead and register. Go ahead and get your seat because I am excited. We are coming back. And lastly, I want to also challenge you to make a firm commitment this year. If you didn't do it last year, make a firm commitment this year that God, I will give unto you. I will be a cheerful giver unto you. I will give my tithe, which is 10% of your earnings. And above and beyond that is your offering. And your giving, can I tell you, it's a byproduct of your relationship with Christ. It's an act of worship that expresses your thanksgiving for all that he's done in your life and will do in your life. And when you get free in this area, you are free in a major way. And those who are watching, if you're not a member of City Mission and this service and this message has been a blessing to you, please consider giving an offering um, to help us continue to saturate homes, communities, and our, our city with the powerful love of Jesus Christ. There's four ways to give. You can send us an email um, and we'll send you an invoice and you can pay through that invoice or you can connect, uh, um, you can give via the church app. It's very, very simple to do. If you need instructions, just shoot your name in there and, and we'll certainly help you out. Or you can do it the old way. You can drop an envelope off, an envelope off at the church or well, if you have a German bank, you can give uh, via IBAN. It's easy. Um, thank you. Um, we love you. And man, we look forward to seeing you in our discipleships, discipleship groups this week. I'll leave you with this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. And guess what? Give you peace. Have a blessed week. We love you.